Yeah, we can. So we can go yeah, two, yeah. two. We Maybe. can go two ways. If you want to talk about the cumulus stuff first or the object stuff first, and then whatever time mm -hmm. we have left, we can try to bug scrub. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Because Zoom got rid of some of its helpful things. I can't spell thirtieth. There we go. Okay. Let's see. I only need to share. Can I please have the share? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, actually, it looks like it stopped me from sharing. You should be able to. But nope. I'm gonna. I'm gonna Maybe. give you. No, I have to give it to you. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna take it over from you. All right, so hopefully you guys can see my screen. So uh, in the community, uh, Maz was playing with the system and was wondering if um, we could use DRP to do ZTP, zero touch provisioning, or cumulus switches. And it turns out with a little change, we could. So I put those into tip. Um, and then he said it was annoying. So I made another change to DRP and tip to make it less annoying. But the general idea is that cumulative switches will do a DHCP or can do a DHCP request the first time. And as they boot, they'll look for an option 239, I think. And yeah, 239 in DRP. And so, or in a DHCP message. And if it does, that turns into a script that can be pulled to operate on. And so Mads and I noticed that the join up script will actually, that Rob had written for joining things like AWS machines and other stuff, could actually be used to um, run inside the cumulus switch. So, um, but it needed a change because cumulus looks for a text string inside the template or inside the um, script to see if it's actually able to be run. And so, look at this join script, you'll see that it now has this. And that's all it needs to actually kick off and say, this is something that can be run as part of the zero touch provisioning. So this is all in tip now as part of the community content. And so what you do is you kind of make sure your default unknown boot env is discovery like we normally do. And that makes the join script available. Then you go into DRP and if DRP is your um, DHCP server, you can specify the join script to, do, to run. The new syntax that you can do when you specify an option that DRP doesn't know about, um, so it doesn't know what type the option is, you can say string colon, and it will treat the rest of it as a byte string. Um, if you're not using tip, you have to convert this byte string into a decimal comma separated List of the Oh, that's what y'all were, were talking about. Okay. So you could you you could take this string, run it through OD dash B or something like that, which will print all of the things in bytes, and then you decimal, and then you put them together and comma separated, and it would work. But now, if you switch the tip, you can actually say string colon, and it'll just take this this off and treat this as just a byte string or a string that it will convert directly into bytes. This tells the cumulus switch to run that script with ZTP. So well, then what happens is, so I'm gonna start my, cumulus also provides a happy little VM that you can import into various systems that runs as a virtual cumulus switch, and it will then do the DHCP work um, and go about its business. If I look, I don't have uh, the switch yet in my machine, it boots up, it does DRP, it does discovery, and there's my switch added to the system. And at this point, the whole task and other parts are running. So a runner is running on the cumulus switch. 
you can actually run tasks. So in this case, it ran through my normal discovery process and is actually sitting in sledgehammer wait for a, another workflow to be added so that I could actually do things like the report, put uh, interface config in, all the other stuff that I could normally do with a task system and stages, I can now do with the keynote switch. It even does the go high inventory as you'd expect. You can see all the interfaces and what's running and what it's running in. And so in this case, you can see I have like vert IO interfaces, a bunch of them. Um, so that it's simulating the switch ports, all of that stuff. Right? Nice. So uh, that's in tip. There's some follow on work obviously that could be done, right? A, a um, workflow environment to do things like updating the switch and all of that stuff, which is actually really straightforward to do now that we have a runner in place, is that a lot of the zero touch provisioning stuff they've implemented as little bash script snippets, things like installing a license file and updating the OAS if it needs to be updated and things like that. And those can now be dropped in and created as tasks so that the cumulus switch can be managed and controlled just like the rest of your so that's one of the things that we've kind of been working on um, and have been made available. And like I said, that's all in tip now. Um, so you can play with it there. So does the ZTP include like provisioning the OS for the router or for the switch? So in this case, um, it assumes that the switch is already has an OS running in it. We don't do the ONI booting work to actually do a recovery if your switch just totally gets cracked. That would be another future item to look into working on. But for right now, um, if your switch has a functional OS in place, then a task to update the um, system would actually be fairly straightforward. In fact, this, for example, shows you could run this snippet to um, where to go? Um, for example, they have um, since the switches are licensed, mm -hmm. you can um, inject this as a task. For example, specify the um, or something like this to actually specify the license file that you want to inject, and then DRP could serve the license file and let you import the license directly into your switch. Same things with updating the OS, right? The switch itself has a update capability. It just needs the URL of the OS and you want to update to. And so that can easily be served much like our image install or service system. And this script basically could run straight up as a task. Right? Um, is, so is that's a task running on the system or is that a... That a... What, Rob? I'm sorry. You could build, and one day here shortly, hopefully we will, build a task in DRP that's associated with a stage called Update Cumulus OS. I see. And you would specify what the target release you want to be at, and then you specify a location on DRP where that file is, and then it would make sure that every time the switch booted, as part of the boot process, make sure it's at the right OS level. And if it's not, update the switch, reboot, and go through the workflow process. I, I, so this is different than doing it with Noni boot. This is actually just saying bring in this, this new. Correct. Right. This would be using DRP's workflows to manage your cumulus switch's life cycle. I guess because you had mentioned Oni, so I was, I was. Yeah, so all of this works and works out of the box because the switch, if it's never been configured with ZTP by default, or if you have the management interface set to DHCP, it will always try and run the ZTP scripts that it finds in the DHCP server. Right. So as a consequence of that, a runner starts. And then depending on the workflow the machine's in, it will do additional workflow states. So you could put your 
switch into a cumulus management workflow that every time the switch booted would run through and say, is it at the right level? It is, let me set it and go about its process. This also lets you have reboot controls and other stuff of your switch from within DRP because it would the runner would follow the same boot environment um, stage change action. Like that. So um, it would work similar to your machine in the environment. Yeah, so you, so from that perspective, you don't you don't need the Oni. The Oni is really not that not that different than what we already do. Well, you so need Oni is if somebody or for some reason the switch switch this ate itself for some reason, right. right? Or became non non bootable from its internal flash storage, right? If that happened, where that got sufficiently corrupted, where you needed to re-image the box from a network boot perspective, then you would need to support ONI. And I think GRP is really close to supporting ONI out of the box, but I think there's a couple of things that we still need to make. So, so, that's, the, so that's the key on side. So the next steps from our perspective is to build a um, content pack that has some stage tasks that that lets you do things like updating the various components, as well as doing things like configuration, right? You could actually, a lot of the configuration can be done by directly writing um, a ports file and an interfaces file and some other stuff like that. And this is where things like um, Net Wrangler and um, the templating components could build ports and stuff. Oh, wow, yeah. For you, so you could do automatic configuration that way. Um, so, you can translate that stuff around. Okay. So that's the switch meeting stuff. That's pretty cool. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Seems, seems pretty straightforward from that perspective. It's a huge deal. Right, so we're, Linux is, is basically Linux, right? So most most stuff just works. Um, yeah, well, it's a Debian like environment. Okay. It's Debian with different stuff. <laughs> were you able to run it on some of uh, the what, they, what white box hardware that they call it or something i haven't i don't have one so i've been doing everything inside of their virtual machine well, which, i'll, I'll which, try to get someone with a with some of that and okay. I, I should be able to scare up some which they the, can some real hardware to put somewhere so that you can actually run it it's it, i'm just curious about because the you the net wrangler it's, you know, uh, serializing all what's on the hardware when it comes up is, you know, I mean, that's, it's like big. <laughs> I, yeah, no, no, no. That's, and in theory, things like LODP should work and stuff like that. So the LODP stage could then be run from the cumulus side to see what things are attached. You know, that, I, that. I don't know if you did, have you looked at the grant stuff? Cause there's a bunch of NS, uh, well, they're redoing a bunch of the, uh, uh, you know, hardware detectors and all that stuff. So they, the NSF and a bunch of people had grants available for, I mean, there's, I don't know. Have you ever looked into that? No, I haven't. Not recently. Uh, it just, uh, and then another military, there's one out here that's, uh, in, um, well, they're putting, um, what do you call it? Oh, AI into military vehicles for auto driving, but I, mm. I don't know if it would be, but they're they're using these standard equipment. A lot of that, they have the brocade switches that they're trying to switch away from. So I don't know. And anyway, I'll look for a box for it to run on. It's, this is neat. I, I was wondering if you could do this a, a while ago. I, th I thought it 
should work, but I didn't know. It was really close. It was really close. Thanks to, like I said, Maz and the community for kind of uh, kicking it off and doing some of the regular. And so does he have a box that he's running stuff on or is he just yeah. doing it? He's virtual? doing it in a, I think he's actually doing it in a real cumulus switch. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so from his perspective, the runner runs and all of that stuff and it's fairly clean. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah. This was this was a couple of nice things coming together, and it, it's fun to see. All right, Greg, you want to try ad hoc objects too? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at now. I'm seeing why this is on. Uh, uh, I have to remember. How did I do this? Am I using the right one? Oh. Hmm. Now I have to remember what I did. Okay, so the idea behind this is that um, the um, plugins often want to have their own data object. And so one of the things that um, is needed is that a place to store and look up and query, like we do for machines, other objects that the system may want to keep track of, um, and the plugin needs to store. And so instead of making plugins have their own storage space, that isn't exportable and all of that other stuff, um, we decided that we could extend the backend data store to include arbitrary objects and then allow them to be indexed and queryable dynamically from the main API path. So this lets you do things like create new objects. So I mean, I've got it right. Um, and so normally, if you're used to your normal API conventions, you can do API v3 machines and sending on, oh, oops, using the right API. So all of a sudden, there's my big JSON blob of all my machines, right? So one option, and so the incrementer, for example, creates the cows API. We're in Texas, so you get cows. So um, the incrementer plugin adds to the back end storage system the cows. And so you can actually now have a front end API that lets you see cows, um, operate on cows. Um, you can list cows, you can get specific cows. So um, Um, Fred. There's the specific cow, Fred. And um, cows have a default object. The default object looks a lot like a machine. It gives you have parameters. Um, you can put arbitrary fields. There's not any validation by default. So it's just a blob of parameters. And so if you look inside of the plugin now, you can define and tell when the plugin loads what objects it should take. So in this case, cows. Since cows has no schema, it just lets you do just about anything. Now, you can also have specified data types, where these are additional fields that you want validated on the object. Now this happens to match the same schema, the JSON schema, that we use for parameters. So in this case, I also add an object called typed cows, which allow you to specify a field spotted, which is required, is a type Boolean. And so whenever you create and go through the normal create process, it created a validator that said you had to have spotted. And then 
you know, can milk or whatever, right? Location. And those are type parameters that become available on side on that object. Now, the other aspect that's neat about defining fields is that those fields also become indexes in the search object. So if I go look and do DRP curl instead of cows, I say type cows. Notice the name or yeah. Uh, you can see that I tried to create a cow at one point that didn't have the spotted field, right? So much like all of our other objects, it follows the same available validated team so that you can get errors on when things aren't valid, you get feedback. And so in this case, I have a type cow of type T, a name TC2 or ID TC2. Notice it still has the parameters and metadata field like you'd expect in the default object, but it also has a spotted top level field that's not a parameter right? and becomes searchable. This allows us to do things like, I want to say, show me spotted equals true, I think that works. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I remember the syntax. If I remember the syntax. <laughs> yeah, so there, so I search for just the spotted cows and that's available. So that way I can actually be filtering and other stuff. The DRP CLI picks up a new um, parameter, I think. And then I have it, I got the right one. Our new option. How does it know? Yeah, it, it can't show up in the commands list, even though it's a thing. Correct, but if I remember, where did I put it? I did this a while back and then I forgot. Um, oh, where you can do an ad hoc object? Correct. Um, sorry, my. I don't see it either. Yeah. Extended. Ah. So if you do extended, you then say extended dash L cows list. And there's my cows through my CLI. Or I can say typed cows. And there's my typed cows. And then I could even do things like ID equals TC1. Uh, if I did that right, did I do that right? Uh, oh, it's gonna work. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do. No. Okay, maybe I'm doing that wrong. I might be. But I think I can still do spotted equals true. Okay, no, I can't do squat. So apparently I must have broken something more. Not something quite right. Um, Oh no, oh, don't put quotes on it. All right, figure that one out. Um, so there I can use my same list fe features to um, specify things, search things. Um, it turns out that the objects are parameters, so you can do the same set, um, like TC1 parameter thread to high. Um, oh. Okay, so my big problem is if you wanted an invalid object. So now if I start listing TC2, show TC2, I can see that there's my thread parameter, and then it also matches the same parameter matching and sorting. And wow. stuff the object. So um, that's plugins now have the ability to do that. So in this case, um, with this feature in place, the pool plugin that will actually switch to a real pool object. Um, 
so that it can then do its normal operations and stuff instead of having to do weird searches across all the machine sets and stuff. So, um, so it's actually going to track which machines are in which pools by right. You'll actually get a faster, better list mechanism and things like that out of the pool sort of thing. Um, but that's what will be pretty shortly on the pool. This is all on tip today. Um, and so expect the plugins and stuff to start taking advantage of it. Um, but it lets you add, I think. And then what that actually does is if you go look into the data space, you'll see that it actually scores. The actual objects and stuff. Right? Oh, okay. Just like normal. Just like normal. So then you can actually do things like um, you can actually build content packs that import them and stuff like that. Oh, you could build a content pack that imports um, ad hoc objects. That's right, and stores them and backs them up and bundles and and bundles, and bundles them, them out and bundles them and all of that. So if I had, if, if I wrote a plugin that needed to track, so it, it, basically a plugin that actually tracks information or has some state to it, this is going to be the, the preferred solution rather than stuffing it into a profile or um, you know, writing um, it somewhere else. Correct. The, the challenge is that machines won't be able to see those objects. Okay. Because the tenant role system doesn't, um, the tokens created for machines won't see them. Um, it also points out that right now, by default, the tenant role system um, will ignore those objects. So there's an element of um, we'll need to think about how we extend the tenant role system potentially to include those objects. Could you do it through the actions? Currently, no. The whole point of this API extension is that they work like full-blown objects without having to go through the action layer. Right. But if I needed to take an action on one of these models from a machine token, I could do it as an action on the machine, right? Through the plugin. You'd have to Through create the plugin. a custom plugin. And then you'd have to give that action right. um, to the machine. The machine would have to have that action as a valid action in the machine token. And that would mean you can't do that. If we don't let you alter the machine token. Um, no, which makes which makes perfect sense. Well, so that's the next set is to add the add these objects into the tenant role system so that there's a way to extend that. Um, the reason we haven't is it means that we have to extend the tenant role system so that you can add new objects. Um, I think. Um, Certainly enough, I think it actually worked, but. Um, but So that's the first level feature or operating. Um, since it's API driven, you still have to have a valid um, token or um, username password to actually access the system. Right. It's, it's all behind that. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm just thinking through the use cases, right? There's some, some things, if it was a machine action, you would probably just store as parameters on the machine. This, this backend is system level data. We, that's being stored. Correct. And yeah, it's it's primary use is if the to keep the plugins from polluting the profile space with their specific uh, state data. Right, but you could you could do it where like you add some IPAM data or some external inventory or classification or something that that. Um, like racks, if you wanted to associate a machine with a rack, you could create a rack. That's construct. right. Actually, that might be the one of the simpler ways to do it. If you wanted to catalog the number, the racks in your data center, and then put them, put you know, have a way to, to search them. That's right. Now, strangely enough, there is, and I haven't exposed this, but it turns out that the enablement 
is through this setup here. And once the object has been enabled once, it's kind of stored that way in the system. And so the, this feature could be enabled without a plugin. Oh. I've chosen not to. Right now, the, on, the only way to add new object types is through the injection of a plugin. So this API call is only through the plugin API to enable that. And this is part of a plugin initialization as it looks for this. Correct. This is the in plugin initialization structure. But, um, but there's nothing to preclude us from moving this enablement API to the top level API. But I felt that was a little too open right now. I wanted plugins to be responsible for enabling that so that it can attract right now. Makes sense. I mean, there's a risk to extending the API in the ways that we've been doing because they can become first class features. That's right. Um, so it makes sense to be a little bit cautious before uh, you make it too easy to extend the API to do random stuff. That's right. Because right, somebody using the using the system, uh, yeah. Well, from a curl command, they didn't wouldn't know that this is a API extension. But from CLI, they would know it was an API extension. Correct. Well, yeah, the CLI doesn't know, though. Yeah. Right now, unlike the Kubernetes API, for example where you can ask Kubernetes to know about all the resources it has enabled. I chose not to put a list resources API endpoint right now mm. to avoid just arbitrary resource exploration. But that may come. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking through the times when I've been in, in projects where we've had API extensions and you know, at some point something is super useful and then it just becomes a part of the, the system. That's right. And what you've done is actually, it's already part of the system. It's really just a matter of allowing you to extend it since it's the same storage backend, it's the same API patterns. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so if, some, if, if racks, if say we use my crazy example and you did racks um, as an object type then and they became popular, we could just move racks as a first class uh, model. Yeah. Into the into the base, that's right. And then, because it becomes a real object, you can actually do action commands that are limited, based upon the models. You could actually say, I want, like so for my cows, I could say, milk, for example, and have that only apply to the cows or the typed cows objects. And then we could actually pass required parameters or whatever um, into the action so that that becomes an action you could do to the system. Right. So just like with pools, you would be able to say pools, retrieve or remove. That's right. And they'd be scoped to the pool. That is correct. Automatically. So then you could do like DRPCLI extended type pools. Um, right. Whatever. Right? That, actually, that makes a lot of sense because then you're when you're taking a pool action, you're always just saying system pool, system pool, allocate, uh, re release, action. You know, from that one action, yeah, okay, yeah. right. And, this, and the system one might just do it as the default one, might infer default. Correct. So you're getting all meta right now, anyway. Uh, how does how would the document because is this the same pattern you're using for the document the auto documentation thing All right so it turns out the documentation if you choose uh and we'll see if i actually did it um see if I did this. since the plugins when we build them where is that? build and show up in content packages. Uh, oh, I don't build it. Dang it. I guess I'll add the incrementer document in. 
Oh, into the list. It's funny. But so it is possible, though. Uh huh. That's cool. So, and I'll show you, like, for example, in the IPMI one that I just did, right? IPMI now has full documentation, right? Not full, I mean, full by Greg standards, documentation. And so you've got all the parameter definitions and even some overviews and what you can configure and how you configure and what actions show up and all that stuff, right? Yay. So inside of a plugin, and I should implement this in the example, um, you define a content pack and all content packs now can have documentation sections. So now here's my IPMI documentation in RSD format that shows up. And you can do the same thing with um, all of the objects have documentation sections. So here I have a documentation, right? This says the uh, this parameter finds the duration of seconds to leave the identify light on when you do an IPMI identify. Okay, so that all gets bundled up into a single RST, right? That our document system, when it's built through our automated build system, gets built, bundled into the doc. Strangely enough, the DRP CLI has a way called document which lets you take a YAML file and generate that RST document based upon your YAML file. So if you actually go look at the community content, YAML file, as we circle back around the docs, the meeting time is almost up. This one's bad because I don't actually have the document file specified, so it's not included. But as part of the meta description, you can define a document called dot underscore documentation dot meta. That's an RFP document that will get injected right here. When you run that command, the content document command on the YAML file, it will take those document that documentation field, as well as all of the documentation fields for each object. And you can see we haven't done a great job of documenting the community content because it existed before this feature showed up. But there's some that we started to show up. So like this is the discovery boot in. Rob's added some document recently so that it will show up and say how you might be able to use the join script, right, that we just talked about for general operation outside of ZTP. And then there's others, right, we give you hints and notes about some of the various sort of boot ends, right? That kind of stuff. So that stuff all gets bundled such that you have your overview section, which is that document. And then you get a per object type definition, which is the aggregation of all those documentation types, including tasks and stages and boot ends and parameters and all of that. So that's how the documentation is actually getting built and put together. The interesting part is you can use your own, um, for your own content packs, you can build your own documentation system and then pull that out as an RST file. And then that's one of the feature items on my list is the one day have the UX have an RST renderer so that it can render the documentation for a content pack in mm. that. No, oh, that's then, then the one more support. one more meta question from I was watching I think well I two weeks ago because you were doing the this is just a uh Docker virtual machine. Is that right? Is that yep, your... Cube for it. so I, I'm just you know that's you know starting to get meta to me. So is that pretty much just because of people are uh, struggling with the bundling or? Uh, Docker, oh. Docker container for GRP itself? Well, I know you can eliminate, you know, basically you, you can nuke uh, what, you know, all the virtual machine management stuff if you do it that way. But I was trying to figure out, you know, is it because that people can't get their stuff packed or they don't want to 
pack their stuff in the doctor. They want a full up virtual machine. And yeah, I, I'm. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're, I think you may be conflating two things. One is DR, we have a Docker file that builds DRP into a container so that it's easier to deploy, though you know, easier than the install script because you can bundle it all together. Yep. For some people, they like it because they take that Docker file and use our container in their CI CD pipeline, which they already have in place for the containers they're building for their normal application. So then they can run DRP through a CI CD pipeline to validate that it's okay. And yeah. then use that, that deployment mechanism that they're already using to deploy their applications through the field to deploy app DRP to their control nodes in their data center. So that's using the container to deploy DRP. A second item is Rob was talking about Vert, which is using Kubernetes scheduling system to manage virtual machines alongside containers um, for systems that don't want to necessarily have to deal with both a virtualization system and a container platform at the same time. This way they can use Kubernetes for both virtual machines and containers. Um, the reason there are reasons to do that because you might need GPU access better than the containers will give you and that kind of stuff um, as an example. So Kubert lets you take care of that kind of action. Okay, Without so so the Kubevert part is just managing the virtual machine. Is that correct? It's basically using that makes sense. You have many choices, but it's like using KVM to manage virtual machines on the local machine joined into the networking space of Kubernetes so that they're peers with the containers and follow the same networking patterns and paradigms that the containers do, but are real virtual machines. I get it. Okay. And, and then on top of that, they do something even a little more silly, not silly, but interesting is they have a Docker format that specifies a virtual machine image inside of Docker. So that they can do Docker pull to get the image locally and then run that in KVM. But that's a whole different. The, doc, the Docker library becomes your, your machine cache. Right. Um, so, okay. I mean, it makes sense ish. You've got sure. one, might as well use it. Um, so that's that. And then at one point, if you're watching our videos, um, I showed using DR, running DRP CLI as a runner inside of a container where I just started it by hand. And the idea there was to point out that you could use a container to represent something that can't run a runner within DRP on behalf of that object. So like if you have a, a dumb switch, right, that doesn't have the ability like these cumulus switches to run a runner, you in theory could spin up a container with a runner that represented that switch back into DRP, and then you could run tasks against it where the task was smart enough to know that inside that container or the things inside that container could drive the switch or whatever. Um, just as an extension of the join script. The point is the join script works sufficiently well that it can not only join virtual machines, but also containers into DRP management as well. So, so those are the three cases that we've been kind of playing with. Probably. And I'm definitely over time now. So I'll shut up. That was good. A lot of good information. I'm going to stop the recording so it doesn't go too long. Or let's see, you might have to in the truck. Uh, you might have to stop. I just got um, Oh. Oh, since you gave me host. Yeah, I made you host. I yeah. can reclaim it and then stop it. Yeah, why don't you do that? I'm doing it.